Something wonderful is happening here. First Boston Design Night. We are at Design Night. Welcome to our first Design Night Boston in the build space. And we are privileged to have entrepreneur, designer, author, and speaker, Ben Ueda, speaking to us about trickle up design. Thanks, Rick. Well, thank you for uh, having me. It's a pleasure, Rick. Um, thank you, Autodesk. So tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about inspiration and progress. So as designers and entrepreneurs, which I think many of you are, as I see a few familiar faces, uh, we need inspiration. We need it for a few different reasons. Uh, we need it for ideas, for new products or business models. And we also need it as fuel to overcome the inevitable challenges and hurdles that we're going to face. The question of progress, I think, is a little bit trickier. Uh, and for me, this question has always been something I've really struggled with, the question of whether or not my work is actually making a significant difference. Uh, I know that my intentions are generally good, but when I really ruthlessly dissect the impact I'm having, it's really easy to see a lot of kind of flimsy arguments for indirect uh, change. So I'll share what I've learned so far and a few stories that have sort of shaped my thoughts and to the point where they're at today. So I grew up in a family of very limited economic means, uh, we, but we used design to create access to things we otherwise couldn't afford. All four of us kids shared a single room growing up, but my mom made these like really awesome like fold-out beds so that we would still have room to play and still could uh, turn it into a sleeping dorm at night. I remember after reading Huckleberry Finn, my brother and I, uh, we didn't have any like trees to cut down that we were allowed to cut down, so we collected a whole bunch of two-liter soda bottles and made these really cool rafts that we sailed down our, our local river. But design was just about problem solving and creating access. And then I went to architecture school and was presented with a slightly more glamorous aspect of design. Uh, design was conceptual, it was esoteric, it was stylish. And the focus seemed to be on elite cities and brands like Guggenheim and Prada. And these things felt a little, just a little too fancy, so I found a few like-minded classmates, and we decided to pursue sustainable design. And I, I would like to attribute that to some sort of ethical choice, but I really think it was more about identity. Uh, I think we were suburban kids who weren't as stylish as some of the urban kids, and this just felt like something that seemed more tangibly good. So, we knew that single-family houses were the most common building type in America, so we decided to focus on that, and we had a pretty simple plan. We said we can make a difference if we make better houses. If we design a lot of houses, we can make a big difference. And so we started an architecture firm and designed high-performance homes like, like this. So they're solar-powered, super-insulated homes that produced as much energy as they used. And it was great. Our work was getting published. We started winning awards. And our commission and client list kept going up. But these homes were also kind of expensive and often were second homes for our clients. So while the technology was sustainable and progressive, the application was a little less noble than what I would have liked. So our conscience was telling us to design sustainably, but our business model was pushing us to primarily deliver it to the wealthy. And this is the issue with design as a custom service, and it isn't unique to our firm. In fact, the average house designed by a custom architect is more than twice the sale price of the average American home. Of course, we did pro bono work. We actually won a competition to design affordable homes in New Orleans for uh, people that were displaced by Katrina. But this is the exception, and it came out of financial consequence to the firm. It takes just as long to design affordable houses. You just don't get paid as much. So we were doing good work, but it was just mostly for rich people. And I'm, I'm really proud of the architecture firm we created. I'm proud of the homes we designed. But I want my career to be about creating opportunities for people, not catering to those who already have them. I don't subscribe to trickle-down economics. So why was I designing for the most privileged and hoping the progressive parts would eventually trickle down? Sustainable design is really important, and the research and the industry leadership that our firm, Zero Energy, uh, is accomplishing, it's, it's beneficial. It's just, it's just not really the kind of progress that, that speaks to me. And the whole time, I just kept thinking that I was designing really good things that my family could have never uh, afforded. So what to do about it? So I began thinking, how could I earn a living designing for people who can't afford to hire me? And I remembered one of my college professors telling me that architects don't make buildings. 
They make drawings that instruct and motivate. And drawings are a type of media, and media can be distributed over the internet to great effect. So instructing and motivating lots of people over the internet could be impactful and lucrative. And so began our adventures in digital media and startups. So we looked at where Americans got their homes designs and were kind of surprised. We saw that architects actually designed less than 5% of the homes in America. And we didn't quite have enough access to capital to become a production builder, so we decided to focus on stock house plans, which makes up about 30% of the new homes. We also realized that all houses in America are already prefab. There's no modular revolution coming. Unless you go into the woods with an ax and like cut down logs and literally make everything from scratch, your house is prefab. Windows are a product, insulation is a product, doors are a product, faucets are a product. And so for a, a real effective, massive modular home company to, to work, you would have to be vertically integrated and bigger than any car company. And with how volatile the housing market can be, it's just not going to happen. But Dwell Magazine still tells us that it will. <laughs> Another thing that we sort of experienced as an anecdote is that we knew that media is a powerful tool that shapes consumer expectations of design. One of the first projects I had out of uh, college when we started a firm is we got a consulting job to consult on solar-powered houses in Lagos, Nigeria. And we're really excited, and as a, as a well-intentioned young designer, I didn't want to be culturally imperialistic. You know, I was like, very politically correct, you know, really want to involve the, the locals. So I put together a, a focus group to sort of see, you know, what these people wanted for their, their houses. So I got the group together, and I said, well, let's just start really simple. What do you, what do you think these houses should look like? Lady in the front raises her hand and she says, oh, I think they should look like the houses on Wisteria Lane. So Wisteria Lane is the fictitious street from the TV show Desperate Housewives. So the silly part for me was to think that architecture was going to be the thing influencing their thing. No, 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 it's media. And the greatest architects in the world are not directly shaping consumer expectations for the built environment. It's media. I actually even think like shows like uh, part of the reason of the popularity of young people living in cities I think it's a direct trickle down from shows like Friends and Seinfeld that sort of showed that as a desirable lifestyle. So we created a business plan, we won a bunch of business plan competitions, and we went out and raised uh, just, just right around a million bucks. Uh, we created a company called Free Green, we gave away free blueprints for affordable, energy efficient homes, and we actually used architectural construction documents as a type of media that was monetized by product recommendations right into the drawings. So you could go onto the site, you could pick from all the different designs, you could get product recommendations, you could take a little virtual tour, click on different things, switch out different options. Another thing that I'm really proud of uh, and that we were able to do, because we used 3D modeling software at the time, which was a little bit newer, things like Revit, which are now pretty industry standard, uh, is we were able to do, you could put into any zip code and get uh, energy modeling data. So you could see how the product decisions we were doing weren't just marketing, they would actually impact your dollar and cents utility bills for every area code in the US, or for every zip code, I should say. We even produced designs that stylistically we didn't like because we realized that we were in the, the course of serving a, a broader population. But we still got to do some little cool homes that we thought were affordable and nice. And it was fun. We figured out some really interesting challenges, like. If you're designing for everyone, for everyone all over the country with different regions, different climates, how do you sort of template things so that people can make localized microclimate uh, adjustments so that the homes are efficient in a passive way? So we figured out all these cool little charts that we could package into the drawing so that people could just get better information for better homes. So we quickly became one of the largest suppliers of home designs in the country. We were reaching thousands of times more people than our architecture firm ever could. But then uh, 2008 happened and the housing market crashed and advertising budgets for the construction industry dried up. The fund that invested in us uh, went under and we didn't get the rest of the money that we were expecting. So in like 2007 when we were raising the money, I thought I was pretty, pretty smart. Uh, I thought that because I was able to throw together a pitch deck and raise a bunch of money that my ideas were inherently valuable. By the end of 2008, I knew I wasn't that smart, and uh, I felt pretty helpless because I realized I was dependent on a whole bunch of favorable conditions. And it was tough. Uh, we lost a lot of employees. Uh, we ended up surviving, and eventually, years later, we were able to get acquired. So I learned a little bit from it. I learned what to do next. 
I wasn't sure at first, but I knew that I wanted to do something without investors or a large team. And it's something I find really concerning when I talk to so many entrepreneurs when they're just rushing to get investors. The minute you take investment, you're locked into a valuation, even when you're still trying to figure out what you're actually doing. You can always wait a little bit longer on those things till you're really ready. Um, so I also knew I wanted to do it without a large team. And I wanted to design things that my family could have afforded. So these were the thoughts in the back of my mind when I had a beer, a beer with a friend who's a furniture designer. And he complains. He had that sort of Brooklyn hipster furniture designer complaint thing going on. Um, and he said, it's impossible to design American-made affordable furniture out of real materials. That the reality of the industry is you have to do high-end boutique and custom work until you get so famous that a big retail chain wants to create a compromised foreign sweatshop made knockoff, and then they'll put your name on it. So I bet him. I bet him that I could get 1,000 pieces of affordable American-made furniture comprised of real materials, something like wood or steel or concrete, delivered around the country for less than their IKEA counterpart. So he took the bet, because he believed that would be impossible, for me at least, to design and deliver something as cheap as IKEA. IKEA has factories, ships, and more than 100,000 employees all aimed at making the manufacturing and delivery of furniture cheap and efficient. I have myself and a few like hand tools. So he believed that in order to get design to the masses, you had to make a product. And he knew that to make a product, you had to spend time and money on prototyping, manufacturing, shipping, and marketing. He made the bet because he didn't see the shortcut. But I knew I was just going to make a YouTube video. So this is the bucket stool video. I posted it on YouTube and shared it on Facebook. Uh, it's a simple design that can be made for less than $5. Just put a little bit of concrete in the bucket, stir it as one of the sticks that'll eventually become the leg. Wait a little bit. And pop it out. <laughs> Instant stool. Yeah. And I, I'm a little biased, but I think it's nicer than its more expensive IKEA or counterpart. It's a little more durable, too, but it hurts more if it falls over on your foot. And people around the world, and this is before I had much of a social media audience, but this is just from sharing it with friends and stuff. People liked it, and they kept reposting. So when people around the world started posting proof that my design idea had reached their physical reality. So this project has now been built on six different continents, and several small businesses have emerged that produce and sell this design. So I won the bet, and more importantly, well, maybe more importantly, uh, I saw that giving away small, simple ideas could be a business. So I was producing media that motivated, instructed, and resulted in economic activity. In order for people to build this project, they often had to purchase materials and tools. And since I didn't have the infrastructure to provide that, I had to figure out a way to direct them somewhere else. And so my lack of resources resulted in the opportunity. Because I didn't have the infrastructure to compete with IKEA, I had to hijack it from somewhere else. So I chose Home Depot. So I design projects from materials that are universally available due to their trucks, their warehouses, and their stores that they are paying for. And my designs in the form of digital media content cause people to go to their stores and buy stuff. Because I, I don't have the marketing budget to compete with a Target or something like that, I had to hijack viewers from BuzzFeed and Pinterest. And I found that because I was creating original content, large platforms were eager to share it with their millions of viewers. So once the content was being distributed, I was able to sign sponsorship deals with brands like Home Depot, Ryobi, and QuickCrete. So once again, I got back into the position of publishing design as a type of media and monetizing it as a type of marketing. So we began sharing more ideas. We try to focus on sharing designs that promote healthy and productive lifestyles, like indoor gardens that allow people to grow food, even in small apartments or durable and sturdy pieces of furniture that can be made affordably, but will last a long time. This is a cool bed. It can be made for about $70, minus the mattress. This is one of our first table projects, just 2 by 12s and iron pipe. Sometimes, though, we just do things that we think are cool or funny. This is one of my favorites. It's a concrete lamp. So you just use a water bottle and a 2-liter soda bottle about 50 cents worth of concrete and a basic light fixture. 
They sell sort of concrete pendant lamps like this for hundreds of dollars at nice design boutiques. We made very simple desks that had storage in them out of a single sheet of plywood. We also experiment with different types of representation. It's like, okay, so we're not dealing with professional woodworkers and makers, so how do we make our instructions even simpler? How do we get them down to one page that anyone can understand? And unlike IKEA, we'll use slightly more detailed humanoids drawings. This is also when 3D printing was first coming on the scene and people were t hyping it up so much. And we're like, well, hold on, let's, let's figure out what we can do with a 2D printer. So we had published these templates that you could cut along the lines, fold them up, glue them together, and then use them to make little cool candles or very, very dangerous coat hooks out of concrete. <laughs> And it was great, because it's so low stakes. We could experiment with all different things. This is one of our famous uh, Lego and concrete projects that I now use as a coffee maker. So the response has been amazing. As of now, our YouTube videos have been viewed more than 40 million times in more than 50 different countries. And we get to do a new project every week, which is, which is fun. Uh, it sort of caters to the, the ADHD of our, of our team. So this is a project I'm particularly proud of. This is a recent one. I was talking to some architecture students recently, and one of them said, it's like, oh yeah, I really want to get into furniture, but I, I don't have access to a CNC machine. And he wanted me to say, like, oh, can I get, he said, can you get me into the Autodesk space? Uh, and I, I can understand that sentiment to a certain degree. Uh, CNCs are robots that can cut things. They're, they're awesome. And you can do really cool furniture with a CNC. But his assessment of his limitations and the idea that he had to wait kind of inspired me to see what I could do without one. So this is a table that's made from a single sheet of plywood from Home Depot. The only tools that you need are a circular saw and a drill. The materials cost less than $45 to make this. That's about, that includes everything, the glues, the screws, the finishes, every single thing that you need. That makes it about one third the price of an IKEA table of a similar size. And that IKEA table is probably gonna be made out of particle board, not plywood. And the fact, you can probably get the power tools and the materials for less than the IKEA table. So could we design cooler tables with a CNC? Probably, but you shouldn't wait to try. You should just get the tools that are available and just go for it. He was waiting for a CNC, and I get it. He, wants, he has this vision in his head of what he wants to create, and I think a lot of designers are perfectionists and very detail-oriented. I'm, I'm not, I'm kind of a mess, and I rely on business partners that are. Uh, but perfection requires opportunity, but you can always make progress. So we live in a world full of particle board, furniture, Taco Bells, and strip malls. We're a long way from having to worry about perfection. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit that we can do without waiting for a CNC machine to do the perfect version. And this is where designers often disconnect from society, is they, they get this vision in their head, which is great, that, that, that image that just becomes an itch that you have to get out there but you can iterate up to that and build opportunities along the way. So for me as a designer, this sort of progress over perfection approach, is, it's really fun and it's rewarding. I can have an idea on Thursday, sketch it out on Friday, build it and film it on Saturday, edit the video on Sunday, and by Monday it's reached hundreds of thousands of people. And the business result is marketing content with a clear call to action, and people choose to watch it instead of fast forwarding through it. So we make commercials that people actually want to watch, and that teach them how to make something for their home. But still though, my, my non-designer friends, my entrepreneurial friends, are always asking why I don't develop products and sell them to my expanding online audience. They worry that I will run out of good ideas and that I won't have capitalized enough on the ones I already gave away. And they always ask, you have this following, just, just make stuff and sell it to them, you can do Kickstarter campaigns, you can do all this. There's two reasons I don't do that. One, from a business perspective, it's lower risk and higher return to create media content that reaches millions of people than it is to spend money on patenting, manufacturing, distribution, and marketing. Creatively, I get to spend my time with new ideas, not value engineering old ones. Quite simply, this model allows my fiscal future to be firmly grounded in my creative present. If I was to develop products, I would spend months, if not years, working on an idea that I already have and I would see new ideas as distractions that would keep me from completing the process. With this media model, I get to bet on intellectual abundance, not scarcity. And I've found that the faster I put ideas out there, the faster new ones rush in to fill their place. So I still get emails, though, about 
people who are, quote, stealing my ideas, because they have an Etsy store where they're literally using my website as a catalog and making my designs and selling them. And I always say that's great. When other people make or spend time to make and sell my ideas, I get to benefit from learning how they improve them. I get to see what changes they made to start to put these things into production. I get free crowdsourced R&D. So yes, please steal my ideas and make money off of them. <laughs> because the surest way to run out of new ideas is to hold on too tightly to the old ones. I, I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs about this, where they, the minute they have an idea, they're already talking about patenting and talking to an IP lawyer, and they're talking, OK, but, oh, it's going to cost like $5,000, and oh, should I just do it on LegalZoom, but it won't be as solid. And it's like, slow down. Work through it a little bit first. People really don't. Unless it's like some crazy code or tech or something, or you know maybe pharmaceuticals or something like that, people aren't going to steal a lot of your a lot of your designs. It's a, still a lot of work to make money out of them. So even though these last three years launching this endeavor, Homemade Modern, uh, it's been the most satisfying in my career. There, there's times I still felt a little insecure about it. Uh, I imagine my architecture peers kind of. I think they like what I do, but I think sometimes some of them are kind of. OK, he's using his master's degree to become a YouTuber. That seems a little overkill. Uh, and overall, I, I'm comfortable with my choice. But it, it did cross my mind that a, perhaps I was giving up the possibilities for more traditional peer recognition. And I wish I didn't care about it, but I do. It's important. And that I also thought that maybe my focus on affordability, my sort of maniacal insistence on that would feel nice ethically, but it eventually would combine, uh, confine my material palette and sort of limit my creative growth. Well, the, the Vitra Furniture Museum uh, asked if they could use my plywood and zip tie chair that can be made for about $25 for an exhibition and workshop that teaches people how to make and design. And they just announced that it's going to be on permanent exhibit there, which is cool. And thank you. I still have to go see it. I haven't, I haven't been over there yet. And I may never get to design a Prada store, but I did get to work with supermodel Coco Rocha, who wanted some bucket stools for her own home. And what's great, it isn't that my work is in museums or fancy people's homes. It's that it's desirable to people and institutions that have lots of options, yet attainable to those that don't. And that was the goal all along, to create aspirational things that anyone can afford. And these little projects, they're we're executing on them, and they're trickling up. The audience is doubling every year, and we're getting opportunities to take on bigger and bigger projects. So we teamed up with a company that makes a small, affordable CNC machine called Inventables. It's about like a $1,400 uh, machine. And we made this uh, spiral staircase for my loft. Uh, the materials and the cost of the machine were less than the cheap prefabricated staircase that my general contractor was recommending. Still figuring out the handrail. I think we're going to have to use the five axis for that. <laughs> it's pretty cool, though. So 40 million YouTube views is, is a lot, but we wanted to reach more people. So in addition to giving away our designs, we decided to start giving away the digital content that we were monetizing. So we syndicated our content to larger media companies to publish on their Facebook pages and Instagram accounts. This is also when the landscape was changing for video, where Facebook was starting to take ground from YouTube. And it was a tough decision, because for a lot of YouTubers, they're, they're very protective of their, of their videos, because that's how they make their money. Um, so we, were, we weren't sure, but we said, you know what? We're just going to let it go. Uh, and the impact was great. Uh, the first one was with uh, uh, Business Insider. They did this one. Right away, it did 11 million views. And once we let go, uh, all these other companies started using it, and we went to over 50 million views in a single month just on Facebook. So things like Five Minute Crafts, even though there's nothing Five Minute Crafty about this. <laughs> even just like pop culture sites like Board Panda and Met Dan are actually really interested in design if you present them in a way that people understand and not get too esoteric about it. So this is obviously done with a massive team of people. Uh, just kidding. It's really not a huge team. It's just me, my little sister Jessie, who I hired uh, about a year and a half ago and brought her on as a partner. And then I have a graphic designer who does a little freelance updates. And our new question is whether or not we can reach a Super Bowl-sized audience every single month. Uh, and we're not 
quite there yet. We're about halfway there. But I think next year or a year after that, we'll definitely get there. And that's kind of nice with three people. Um, and as we grow that audience, we can then weave in new designs that are actually probably a little bit more impactful. So I think urban food production is really interesting and potentially important. And so we're starting to work on DIY indoor robotic gardens that allow food to be produced all year round. And if there's uh, any engineers out there that want to work on mo moisture sensors or irrigation controls, come find me later. So where do we get our inspiration and where do we direct our passion? As architects, it may be from looking at the world's greatest museums. We look at the historically important buildings. Uh, from entrepreneurs, it might be looking at the studying the rise of billion dollar startups. But when young people try to reverse engineer greatness, they find that there are a lot of factors involved that make it a dependent pursuit. You got to get admitted to the good school. You must find the right internship. Network to find the right business partner. Secure the commission or the investment. None of these steps are autonomous. And all of them require approval or cooperation from other entities. A journey inspired by this type of greatness, it's, it's really hard. And it's riddled with frustration and rejection. It's also heavily weighted in favor of the wealthy and privileged. So I mean, a lot of us have ideas for startups or products or a piece of architecture. But we're kind of waiting for an opportunity, an investor, or a commission. If we love design and making, though, why do we wait? So I say just maybe when you find yourself waiting, you should try changing your source of inspiration. Maybe the inspiration should be about finding a good next step that would progress the idea, not the master plan that would lead to the billion dollar company. I suggest finding inspiration in terrible design and inconvenient services. I suggest seeking out the thoughtless, the banal, the stupid objects that populate our world. Relying on greatness for inspiration is kind of like relying on sugar for energy or sustenance. It's meant to be rare and consumed in small doses. And it often puts us in the mode of emulation rather than creation. And emulation isn't a path, just like uh, reposting inspirational Instagram quotes isn't going to make you a better entrepreneur, although it seems to be a very popular path. <laughs> Hashtag struggle is real. <laughs> so for me, it's like the Guggenheim Foundation hasn't exactly come knocking on my door and asked me to design their next museum. Uh, Google hasn't asked me if they can acquire any of my IP. Those would be great opportunities. I would like them. I hope one day I'll, I'll earn something like that. But I don't want to spend time on proposals or maybes. I simply want to design the opportunities I have right now. And I can design what is in my living room. And I'm only limited by creativity and a tolerance for sawdust everywhere. Or metal shavings is what it's been a little more lately. So yeah, I, I believe that good design is rarer than it should be. But I think there's good designers all around us. Uh, I think this dis disconnect comes from a business model problem and an inspiration problem. The business model problem is that so many designers adopt a service professional business model where they react to commissions and are compliant to patronage. The inspiration problem is that good designers often seek inspiration from the rare and anomalous examples of great design rather than the readily available abundance of terrible designs. This is why you see in like books of like famous modern architecture housing, there are all these like lake houses in these unique settings, not these like little row houses that can really be replicated. So say, yeah, I could design something awesome too. Just give me you know, a $5 million piece of land. So I had this architect friend, and uh, he told me this theory. We were, we were, having, we were having drinks. Uh, and his, this theory was about poor conservative voters who voted for lower taxes for the wealthy because they believed in the capitalist dream that one day they would become wealthy. And then without any sense of irony, he, to he told me how exhausted he was from working on a competition entry for a Guggenheim uh, museum, where thousands of architects spent hundreds of hours trying to win the design lottery. His apartment was a mess. He was surrounded by uh, takeout food packages. And he was investing his time in things he couldn't control the outcome. And he was working 60 hours a week at his architecture firm. And then any extra energy was going towards competitions he never won. And you see the same thing in tech, where smart people are so intent on finding that billion dollar idea, they overlook a local $100,000 idea that's right in front of them that could serve as a stepping stone, could give back to their community. And I, I like that they're inspired by trying to be great, but you know, what about good? What about better? And what about progress? 
So I, I like this idea of trickle up design, and I, I think it works. I'm inspired by terrible things, and I think I can make them just a little bit less terrible. Uh, I may never author something singularly great, uh, but I hope I will, and I'll keep trying. But I know I've contributed to thousands of little things that are pretty cool, and I know that by executing on small projects, and I'm getting closer and closer to bigger projects with fewer strings attached. So that being said, I don't always follow my own advice. Um, I was asked recently to apply to the Boston Design Biennale uh, by a friend who's part of the organization. And I was like, oh, I don't know. I don't like spending my time on my applications because I, I have things I can do right now that are for sure. Like, I don't want to do a maybe. But anyways, he talked me into it. He said, like, oh, you're a lock. So I stopped what I was doing, put the application together. And that's always like a really weird process. It shouldn't take that long. It always takes a long time. Well, a few months later, I found out that I got honorable mention, which is like fourth place at the Olympics. It's just out of the medals. <laughs> so in a very polite rejection letter, they mentioned my lack of installation art experience as being one of the reasons. They're like, oh, we love your small projects, but we think you should have this. So it took a few days for the annoyance and rejection to dissipate. But when it did, uh, I, I asked, well, what did I really miss out on? A chance to experiment outside of my comfort zone and with installation art? OK. A chance to create a spatial experience rather than a digital one? Yeah, that makes sense. But when I stopped feeling sorry for myself, I realized that these were opportunities I could create for myself. So I reached out to a friend that owns a gallery, and he said I could use it for an exhibition. I reached out to other designer friends, uh, graphic designers, engineers, and architects, and asked if they had ideas that were outside of the expertise from their day jobs. And so we created a new organization called Design Cloud. It's a collective studio that creates and explores and exhibits design ideas all outside of people's core expertise. Because I think, I think there's graphic designers that could design awesome clothing or furniture. I think there's furniture makers and engineers that could do awesome installation art. And I think together we can design our own opportunities and no approval or applications needed. So we'll be launching our first exhibit late this summer here in Boston, and all of you are invited. So a little warning. I, I, I really hate the expression, reach for the stars. It's just it's always annoyed me. I feel like it's one of the lies we tell children. Uh, I, I, I don't think we should reach for the stars. I think we should find interesting and fun ways to build from the ground up. And if we keep making the things around us better by passionately pursuing progress, I, Trust us, someday we'll suddenly realize we're higher than we could have ever imagined. And we'll look up from our work and we'll realize we're standing on something that's, that's actually great. So with that, I'm going to leave you with a homework assignment. It's optional. It's extra credit only. Uh, take one day a month and design something where you can control the opportunity. Not a proposal, not an idea. Design a small thing that you can make happen. Uh, find something in your home that's a terrible. Design something that's a little bit better. Uh, experiment, learn. And if you find something that's a little bit better, share it with your friends and family. And it actually doesn't have to be furniture or a physical item. It could be a recipe or a line of code or a piece of music. But I think you'll be surprised at how opportunities and impact can trickle up from these little acts of design and making. So do this because it's the right thing to do, or do it because you want the attention and the Instagram likes. But do whatever motivation you find, but whatever you do, don't let creativity waste inside you. Thank you.